Hi, thank you. So yeah, uh, my name is Matthew Dunn. I'm Android engineer here at Babylon. Um, and as I say today, we're going to be talking a little bit about certificate pinning um, and its potential replacement certificate transparency. Now, first of all, I mean, a question for the audience. Who actually here thinks H HTTPS is secure? <coughs> Lots of confidence in the room. Um, it's actually not probably actually all that bad. HTTPS actually does a pretty good job of uh, securing our network connections. But there are some things we actually need to be aware of. Um, and these are the things that we need to be aware of, of why things like certificate pinning came popular in the first place. <clears throat> so first of all, we're going to start and actually look at what it means to try and make a secure connection. The first thing that happens is a client says hello to the server. Um, and in that message, it typically uh, gives a list of, of the supported encryption ciphers that it, that it supports. The server says hello back. Um, and with that, it picks one of those encryption uh, ciphers. And also, importantly for us, it um, provides its certificate. Now, this certificate is something that actually identifies that server as being the server that we know. <clears throat> and, you know, obviously not somebody else. <clears throat> now, it's actually up to the client, though, at this point to actually verify that certificate is legitimate. Um, and in doing so, it actually attempts to build a certificate chain. Now, usually this works by taking the leaf certificate, which is what the server provided us, and using the issue of distinguished name, it finds the intermediate certificate and the root certificate. And the root certificate is something that would be actually in, installed on, onto the user's device. Now, to actually ensure trust, it uses the public keys within those certificates to verify the signatures within the, um, the child certificates. Um, and that's what, what gives that trust. But actually, the question here, the kind of interesting point to ask is, you know, we have these root certificates installed on the device, but actually, how did they get there in the first place? And actually, this all originated from a commit um, to the Netscape browser back in 1990, but actually has quite sort of big ramifications on what that actually means for HTTPS security. It means that actually, we implicitly trust those root certificates installed on our devices, and that means we're actually trusting certificate authorities as well that sign those certificates. And actually often we're not just, it's not just those root certificates, it's the intermediate certificates as well that, that also provide certificates that, such as um, the leaf, certificate, leaf certificates that our servers use. <clears throat> and we're trusting them to basically only issue certificates for domains for, for people who actually own those domains. Now, if I showed you these two um, certificate authorities, would you trust them? I mean, they both have trust in their name, in their, in their slogan. <coughs> um, of course, this wouldn't be a talk without it being something like hacked. <coughs> and in fact, um, they were both hacked back in 2011. Um, and actually, with DigiNotal, which is a Dutch uh, certificate authority, this actually resulted in Google.com certificates being out in circulation on, on the internet for about five weeks. Um, the ramifications of that means, though, that whoever had control of that certificate could basically pretend to be Google.com and perform man-in-the-middle attacks and basically would have all your in what would have been encrypted data. And this is the thing. There's, although there's nothing inherently insecure with HTTPS connections themselves, it's actually more to do with the actual trust of those certificates in the first place. You know, we trust those root certificates and thousands of intermediate certificate providers um, to sign uh, against certificates that, well, to the people they should do. And actually, this is why, I say, certificate pinning actually gained popularity. <clears throat> now, the way certificate pinning actually works in terms of getting around uh, this sort of trust problem is given you perform your normal sort of trust checks, in addition to that, you can also effectively pin against um, one of the certificates. You're basically going to ensure that one of those certificates appears somewhere in that chain. And usually we do this by taking a hash of the public key. Or actually, more specifically, it's actually the subject public key info field. And actually, a simple implementation in OKHTP, you, you create a certificate pinner, and you know, it's, it's pretty much a one line of code to, to get it implemented. But there's a lot of important questions that actually you have to answer which certificate do you pin against? 
So if you pin against the, the leaf certificate, you're basically trying to say, well, you, you only trust your own cert. Um, but there's a risk that when you rotate certificates, um, often your public key may actually change. You would actually need to have a separate public key installed there. If you don't have that public key actually in your app, you're basically going to block access for all your users. An alternative is you can look at uh, pinning against either the intermediate or the root certificates. It gives you a bit more flexibility. You're basically, though, saying that you trust one of those certificate authorities, and actually it does mean that should you need to create a new certificate, you, know, you are going to have to create it with that certificate authority to, to not block your app. But if you do need to change providers, again, you're still slightly screwed. Now, actually, common recommendations typically um, suggest that actually it's best to pin against both a leaf certificate and, and an intermediate certificate um, to give you the sort of best compromise, um, less chance of block bricking your app, but more risk that people might be able to perform a middle attack. <clears throat> and of course, I mean, this also means you'd need to think about actually how compromise is handled. Um, you can, well, if we look at something like OKHTP, the way that happens is, is if a pin doesn't match, the software will fail hard um, and you know, block access, but that typically will mean you'll need to push out a new update to your app. Um, or you could fail soft and knowingly let attackers through. Um, or actually there's one company that, that I'm aware of uh, does they actually have a feature flag in their app um, that they can disable uh, certificate pinning remotely. Now, that flag itself actually isn't protected by any sort of pinning or anything like that, so actually you could just perform a man in the middle attack and just remove all that certificate pinning. Um, now, in terms of sort of real life example, um, back in 2016, Smashing Magazine actually needed to rotate the certificates. Now, actually, this is a web example, um, but it's a very similar situation. Obviously, not everybody in the web, um, not everybody visits your website all the time. And when they came to rotate their certificates, they actually blocked access to a lot of users for actually about a year. And it's reasons like this that has actually led um, Chrome to actually deprecate support uh, for pinning actually back in uh, July 2018. <coughs> so configuring certificate pinning is, is actually correctly as hard. There's a lot of sort of questions you actually need to answer. Um, I've not put all the questions in this. I have a blog post that actually does sort of go into more details of what sort of things you should be thinking about. Um, and really, there's a high risk of, of breaking your app. And I say now, when we look at web and, and they're deprecating it, what they're replacing it with is certificate transparency. So actually, Google started to standardize this actually back in 2012. Um, and actually, as of today, most of the major browsers actually have uh, support within them to try to support certificate transparency. <coughs> Now, certificate transparency actually has three kind of main aims. The first one is it tries to make it hard to issue certificates without the domain owner actually knowing, provides auditing and monitoring of, of, of those to spot a misissuance of certificates, and attempts to protect the user from, from misissued certificates. <coughs> now, it does this by actually publicly ensuring that when you create a new certificate, this is actually publicly logged. So any time you create a certificate, everybody knows. So if someone does go and try and create a Google.com certificate, Google will no doubt know. Um, and because of this, it actually means that in the case of like Diginotor and Komodo, we would have actually been aware that these certificates had, had leaked out onto the internet within hours and not actually the weeks that it ended up being. And the thing here is by being able to detect that, you're actually then able to react quickly to that and get those certificates revoked and hopefully you reduce the chance of damage. Um, now, the log servers themselves are um, they're actually append only. They use a Merkle tree hash behind the scenes to prevent tampering and misbehavior, um, and that actually aids the sort of auditing and monitoring. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Partly, I don't really fully understand it, but there is a good talk that um, Google did a couple of years back called The Very Best of Certificate Transparency, which you can find on YouTube. So I would suggest actually watching that. Now, one question, of course, is does certificate transparency actually work? Um, and there's actually two sort of examples we can look at. The first one was from uh, Facebook. So I think this is probably back from 2016. Um, through using certificate transparency, they noticed that actually they'd had a domain 
uh, a certificate being issued for a domain that didn't go through their usual certificate authority. And in addition to that, it wasn't even authorized by their security team. And again, because of certificate transparency, they're able to spot that very quickly, get those certificates revoked, um, actually in a matter of hours. Um, I mean, incidentally, with that particular incident, um, those certificates were created by someone internal, to, uh, by an actual Facebook employee. Um, so there wasn't anything nefarious going on. But actually, in the case of um, Google, um, a, a certificate authority actually generated a Google.com certificate that they shouldn't have been generating. And again, Google were aware of this very, very quickly, able to get it uh, revoked. Um, I mean, the certificate authority's excuse was, well, we were just testing, um, <coughs> as is often the way. Um, so does certificate transparency actually work in the, in the in real, real world? Well, it, it does. But actually, the very most important part of it is, is really around the sort of monitoring side. It's up to you to actually monitor the, the uh, log servers for the creation of those certificates and see if someone's actually misissuing them, to, and then you to take the actual necessary steps to get them uh, revoked. Now, I've mentioned sort of two tools on the screen here. Both are open, uh, well, both are free. One is open source, the other one is Facebook's. Um, and the interesting thing with Facebook's tool, it actually also um, has support for spotting phishing domains. So for instance, if you know, people put domain names in with similar spellings, um, it attempts to spot those as well, so you can be more aware of what well, what other routes hackers are trying to get into your site. Um, but of course, that begs the question of what we need to do from a sort of client point of view, what, well, in fact, what we need to do from a mobile point of view. So <coughs> when we submit a log server, when we submit a certificate to log server, it generates this thing called a signed certificate timestamp. And it's then, as part of that handshake that we saw earlier, it's up to the client to actually verify that signed certificate timestamp um, and check that it is legitimate. Now, the thing here is actually what's kind of quite important. When you look at certificate pinning, there's this reliance on that public key. You change your public key, you have to change your app. There's no reliance with certificate transparency on, on that. It's relying on the public logging of, of, to those log servers and your checking of that instead. Um, and it also means to say, because there's no dependency on public key, you don't actually have dependency on what certificate authority you're using, as long as it supports uh, certificate transparency. Now, there are actually three different ways um, a client can receive signed certificate timestamps. I'm only going to talk about the most common one, um, which is on the top million sites is on about 80% of them. Um, and generally, I say the process works something like this. So, you ask a certificate authority for a certificate, they generate a pre-certificate, that gets sent to the log server. The log server will generate that signed certificate timestamp and returns it back to the certificate authority. They then create a certificate that, from that pre-certificate and that signed certificate timestamp, bundle the two together, and that's what's returned to your server, and then that's what you actually return to the client in your handshake. Now, actually, the great thing with this, it doesn't actually require any changes um, from a sort of client, well, from a server perspective, it's much more reliant on, on the certificate authority actually supporting this in the first place. Um, and of course, as I say, during that handshake, if there's any discrepancies, basically the client should, should reject the connection. Now, they do this by verifying those signed certificate timestamps. Um, I mean, this works by, effectively, the clients have an embedded list of all the log servers that they trust. Um, and actually, both Apple and uh, Google actually publish their own uh, log list. Apple's is very much based off Google's. It is a direct copy. Um, but in that, it, each of the log servers um, publicly lists its public key. And you can use that public key then to verify the, the signature of a signed certificate timestamp actually came from, um, from one of those log servers. Now, in a more in-depth check, you can actually then call that log server and actually verify that, um, that it actually has got um, a log entry for your, for your server. Now, what this means on from a mobile perspective, because obviously that's why we're here. Um, if you're on iOS, which clearly most of us, none of us will be, um, it's very easy. There's built-in support. You use the app transport security, you set one flag, and you're basically done. 
Um, <coughs> of course, Android being Android, we, we like to make things hard for ourselves. Um, there are a couple of open source projects you might want to look at. Um, Conscript, which is actually part of the actual Android framework, um, does have some code in it to support certificate transparency. Unfortunately, you need to set random st system properties and God knows what else to actually enable it. It has native dependencies as well. It's not particularly viable at the moment. Um, possibly this might change as well in the future. Uh, obviously, with Android Q, they are trying to unbundle Conscript from the platform to be able to update it independently. Um, but it's hard to obviously know at the moment where that's going to actually lead. And there's also the Certificate Transparency Java project, which um, being a Java project, it uses Apache HTTP client, because we love that as well. Um, it also depends on things like Protobuf, even though it doesn't actually use it. So we thought we could do better. Um, and it's actually why today we're actually open sourced our own Certificate Transparency Android library. Um, now, the, actually, the code of it is actually based quite heavily on it, It's derived from the Certificate Transparency Java project, but we've spent a lot more time actually making it Android friendly. I mean, for first, we made 100% Kotlin, which I think was always a good move. Um, I mean, it's important for us to be backwards compatible, and although today I would say it supports API 19, this is purely because this is our minimum SDK. Um, the library itself doesn't really contain anything that wouldn't be support anything less than that. Um, so it probably has better support. We just don't support ourselves. Um, you can use it in a debug mode as well if you want to try the library out in production but not actually enable it. Uh, you can get sort of feedback of whether, this, whether checks would actually work or not. Um, and there's a sample app as well, and there's examples for OK HTTP, uh, HTTP URL connection, volley. Um, it would also work with Apache HTTP client if you were that way inclined. You would just have to do a bit more work to support that yourself. Um, now, interesting enough for us, though, I mean, what's actually also interesting, though, is with this being an actual se separate library, it actually means we can embed it in our SDKs that we provide our third parties and actually enforce certificate transparency at that level as well. Um, whereas on the iOS side, that configuration is, is purely application side. Now, of course, we've talked a lot about trust. Um, the main thing is why would you trust this library in the first place? Um, I mean, we very much want to be very transparent about our security. It's a terrible pun. I apologize. <coughs> I mean, we have obviously unit tests and integration tests. Clearly, it's an open source project. You can go and check them out. Um, we have about 70% test coverage at the moment. Um, and actually, with some of these tests, we try and replicate some of the common man in the middle attack vectors. And actually, some of the attack vectors that actually things like certificate pinning had failed on previously. Um, we've also sort of open sourced our threat models that we've performed this. Um, and that goes and shows a lot more sort of detail of actually how the library works and where we think people could actually attempt to hack this. Um, and it's definitely worth people looking at that to get, get a better in, insight. Um, and it also shows where you know, we know we can do better. Um, of course, we do internal testing. And actually, very recently, we've, we've also been doing some external pen testing. Um, as I said, the library's just gone through an external pen test literally uh, last week. It has successfully passed. We haven't got all the details of it yet, but we're obviously more than happy to share the details of that when, when we have them. And so that's it. I mean, that's why we think you should trust it. But actually, how do we go about implementing that? Of course, we want things to be easy, and we've hopefully achieved that. It doesn't look any di much different for how you actually go implement certificate pinning. Um, you create a certificate transparency interceptor. It works as a network interceptor. Um, and you just provide a list of domains that you want certificate transparency enabled for. Um, and I say, said before, it also supports uh, volume and HTTP URL connections. Now, I could just end the talk there, um, but I wanted to sort of highlight one area that uh, still requires some, some more work. Now, one of the important things with certificate transparency, it makes it easy to spot misissuance. Um, you've got public log servers, you just look in those and you can see when someone's created a certificate for your domain. But it's still your responsibility to actually get that certificate revoked. However, there's a big problem with that. On Android, 
certificate re revocation actually is completely ignored. So currently, if you've got a um, revoked certificate, Android will, will let it through. Um, I mean, we will probably do some more work on this ourselves to create some more libraries to actually better support that. But obviously, as well, we want to actually work with the community to try and actually build secure apps. Um, and yeah, so if anybody has any questions, um, anything like that, please come up, talk to us, ask questions. <laughs>